success at the time, but it turned out to be an absolute disaster in terms of uh, its long-term uh, consequences. And I think I mentioned to you in a previous talk that everybody's got their own story about Pearl Harbor, but when I was living in America in the 1980s, I lived with a woman whose husband had been the military attaché for the United States in Germany before the war, and he was adamant that uh, the president knew about the impending attack on Pearl Harbor, but he told the guy with the uh, decoded messages to get lost for three days uh, and allow Pearl Harbor to be attacked in order to have the impetus and anger from the American public to get them into the war. Because at that stage, the Americans certainly didn't want to go to war. And in fact, in fact the president had run for his office on the basis that he would not take America to war. So whether that story is true or not, in the, the track of the ships uh, on the Pearl Harbor, the carrier task force leaving, leaving uh, Japan up here and coming across the Pacific down here to above Honolulu, all of these times and dates are Tokyo time, and then the ships went back on a totally different course. And what's interesting, of course, is that the American carriers were not in Pearl Harbor. Now, why was that? I don't know. A few days after Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto appeared on the front page of Time magazine. And the bottom line, which you can't read, but it says, daring expression of a brilliant treachery. So, on having smitten a sleeping enemy, it is more a matter of shame simply for the one through the Coral Sea. So we've come up through here, and of course, one of the key battles after Pearl Harbor was the Battle of the Coral Sea, and that battle then 4th to 8th of May. As I said in my talk yesterday, some historians believe the Battle of the Coral Sea was one of the key battles in the whole of World War II an absolute key battle, not because one side had victory over the other, but because it blunted the Japanese attack and kept them out of Port Moresby, kept them out of their reach to Australia and protected the supply lines between America and Australia. And then a month later we had Midway. Now Yamamoto had warned that in the first six to 12 months of a war with the United States and Great Britain, 
I will run wild and win victory upon victory. But then if the war continues after that, I have no expectation of success. And the Battle of Midway was exactly to the day, six months after Pearl Harbor. And of course it was uh, United States intelligence uh, that had decoded Japanese messages and the Battle of Midway was an absolute disaster for the Japanese and probably the first clear naval defeat of the Japanese in 300 years. Now this photograph is the last photograph ever taken of Admiral Yamamoto in Rabaul. And I said a little bit about uh, Rabaul in uh, my previous talks and what an important strategic place it was. The Japanese moved in, they, the Australians ran for their lives and were overrun by thousands of Japanese and those numbers built up to approximately 140,000 Japanese in Rabaul and the surrounding area. Largely hidden in hundreds of miles of tunnels. And so Rabaul was a key strategic place that the Allies had no success in getting the Japanese out of until Japan, Japan surrendered in 1945. So Yamamoto used to travel around uh, quite a lot. In fact, I had dinner with somebody last night who said he stayed in Baguio in the Philippines in the same house that Yamamoto used to live in during the war. Well, Yamamoto certainly moved around and he was in Rabaul on a mission to boost morale and he was on an inspection flight and he came in and then he flew out of here in April 1943. I'm going to show you an original newsreel from the time that shows, that sums up what actually happened uh, on this particular mission to get rid of Yamamoto after it was decided that uh, he had to go. Now his brilliant attack at Pearl Harbor was now turning out to be a strategic disaster for the uh, Japanese as the United States industrial might uh, brought into action and as the Battle of Coral Sea and Midway blunted the Japanese power and also Yamamoto's plans were starting to fall apart. They were too complicated, they were piecemeal and however he was still uh, infamous for his attack on Pearl Harbor hated by the Americans, regarded still as the chief Japanese tactician, and so vengeance on Yamamoto was a US military priority from the highest level, and this operation is the result of that. Fire. 
Japanese learn that jet ski loading strikes hard and fast. Watch on his tail, Lieutenant Barber keeps to his gun. Look at this spectacle. Not all of that footage uh, was uh, from the actual battle, uh, but it was stitched together quite well. This is what the United States were using. These lightning planes, they were the only planes the Americans had that had the range, the uh, P-38 Lightnings. And I'm going to uh, read you a little bit out of Roger Ames's book. Now he was actually there, and I think it's always great if you have a first-hand account. An account written by somebody who was actually there. Now Roger Ames died in the year 2000 and his book came out in 2007. It was called Air Combat and History of Fighter Pilots. And I think it's worth, uh, the, the writing in black and italics is uh, Roger's uh, own description of this particular mission. Now the photograph down there um, shows you um, some of the pilots. Let me just can't quite see it from here. So on that photograph there, you've got um, you've got Rex Barber on the right, Major John Mitchell, and I want to look for Lanfear. Yeah, so Lanfear is on the left. Now the two key figures in this are Barber and Lanfear because Lanfear came back and claimed that he shot down Yamamoto. And Rex Barber said he shot down Yamamoto. So it, what was a very successful mission and should have been something to celebrate, arguments went on for decades. And even today, after all the men are dead, there are still conjecture. And there were court cases and trials and things went on for decades about who actually shot down uh, Admiral Yamamoto. I think in battle, whether it's uh, in the Navy battle or Air Force, it's often very, very hard to actually know whether you've shot somebody down or not. The Americans claim they shot down one of the Zeros. Well, that Zero wasn't shot down. He actually it was on fire. He landed at a nearby Japanese base, got his engine repaired, and then flew back to his other base the next day. So that doesn't count as a kill. Um, so what pilots think in the heat of battle and what they see and what they think is often quite different to reality. So it's a pity that this uh, group of young men who were so successful in their mission spent the rest of their lives arguing about who actually was successful. Anyway, Roger's book, I'm going to read you uh, a bit of text from his book. The Navy would never have admitted it, but the Army's P-38 was the only fighter with the range to make the approximately 1,100 mile round trip. Now, as the crow flies, it was shorter, but they decided to fly around, uh, 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 beyond the horizon of the islands to try and avoid coast watches, and uh, it was actually an 1,100 mile round trip. We were under the command of the Navy at Guadalcanal, so you can bet they had taken the job if they were able. According to the intercepted message, Yamamoto and his senior officers were arriving at the tiny island uh, of Balal, just off the coast of Bougainville, at 9.45 a.m. the next morning. The message said that Yamamoto and his staff would be flying in Mitsubishi GM G4M Betty bombers, escorted by six zeros. The Yamamoto trip was to include a visit to Shortland Island and Bougainville. Mitchell was to be the mission commander of 18 P-38s that would intercept, attack and destroy the bombers. That's all the P-38s we had in commission. Now on the left is uh, uh, Lanfear again, and in the middle is Bobby Holmes, and on the right is, is Barber. Now these are the three surviving killer pilots. What happened was when the, when the mission took off, 
they said, okay, you four pilots, you'll be the killer pilots, you will go after the bomber. They only thought there was one bomber. So if they'd known there was actually two bombers, they would have had to have more pilots going for the bomber, bombers. But they put uh, four pilots onto being the kill squad, and the rest of the uh, P-38s were there to keep the zeros away. So it's interesting, the two key figures here are Lanfear on the left and Barber on the right. The fourth pilot, Lieutenant Raymond Hind, did not return and was never found. So he is actually the only casualty of the whole mission. It's quite incredible. Uh, none of the zeros were lost and only one of the uh, P-38s. So, the book goes on, led by Mitchell, we planned the flight in excruciating detail. Nothing was left to chance. Yamamoto was to be at the Bilal airstrip just off Bougainville at 9.45 the next morning, and we planned to intercept him 10 minutes earlier, 30 miles out. To ensure complete supply, a surprise, we planned a low-level, circuitous route, staying below the horizon from the islands we had to bypass because the Japanese had radar and coast watches just as we did. We plotted the course and timed it so that the interception would take place upon the approach of the P-38s to the southwestern corner of Bougainville at the designated time of 9.35 a.m. Each minute detail was discussed and nothing was taken for granted. Takeoff procedure, flight course and altitude, radio silence, when to drop the belly tanks, those were the tanks that uh, of extra fuel they carried underneath them, and you'll see that in a clip that's coming up, you'll see that the Zeros also had belly tanks. That was for extra range. And of course the Zeros had um, a huge range, and that was why the one P-38 was shot down, because uh, one Zero pilot decided that he was going to, he was so angry at uh, having lost the battle, he wanted to hunt down some of the Americans on their way back. Of course, the Americans were cruising at low altitude, trying to save fuel, trying to get all the way back to Guadalcanal, and one of the Zeros caught up with um, the one P-38 that was shot down. So the Zeros had belly tanks uh, and were long range, and the P-38s had huge belly tanks. Okay, so the tremendous importance of precise timing and the position of the covering element all were discussed and explained until Mitchell was sure that each of his pilots knew his part and the parts of the other pilots from takeoff to return. Mitchell chose pilots from the 12th, 70th and 339th fighter squadrons. These were the only P-38 squadrons on Guadalcanal. The only belly tanks we had on Guadalcanal were 165 gallon tanks so he had to send, to send to Port Moresby for a supply of the larger 310 gallon tanks. We put one tank of each size on each plane. That gave us enough fuel to fly to the target area, stay in the area where we expected the animal for about 15 minutes, fight and come home. So they had to be right on time. Everything had to work out exactly according to schedule. If the Japanese were late or early or whatever, and they, they only had enough fuel to stay in the area for 15 minutes. The larger fuel tanks were flown in that night and ground crews worked all night getting them installed along with the Navy compass in Mitchell's plane. So, this, they, they, they now arrive at the uh, battle site and 18 of the P-38s take off, but one of them bursts the tyre on takeoff, and the other one has problems with his fuel tank, so those two uh, pull out. Now the flight was two hours and five minutes over the ocean, flying very low, between 10 and 50 feet above the ocean. And to keep themselves awake, some of the pilots counted sharks, others counted driftwood, but they were flying incredibly low. It was lucky for the Americans that, ever, that the Admiral, being a very precise man, was exactly on schedule. Now after that two hour and five minute flight, the Americans arrived one minute early. 
I thought, well, I'm going up on the higher and we're going to be up there and have a turkey shoot. We expected from 50 to 75 zeros should be there to protect Yamamoto, just as we had protected the Secretary of Navy, Frank Knox, when he came to visit a, a couple of weeks before. We'd had as many fighters in the air to protect Knox as we could get off the ground. I guess the Japanese had all their fighters lined up on the runway for inspection. Now they had 75, the Japanese had 75 zeros on the ground at Guadalcanal, 75. And as you know, the Zero was a, an amazing fighter, very light, very nimble, could turn on a dime. And in fact, the Americans captured a Zero and took it to America and pulled it apart. And they found that even one coat of paint on a Zero would slow it down by 20 miles an hour. It was a very lightweight machine and very nimble. So the Japanese kept their the 75, 75 of their Zeros were on the ground at um, Guad at Bougainville waiting for um, the Admiral to arrive. So, none of the Zeros came up to meet us. Our intercept force encountered only the Zeros that were escorting Yamamoto. As Lanfear and Barber were intercepted by the Zeros, Lanfear turned head on into them and shot down one Zero and scattered the others. This gave Barber the opportunity to go for the bombers and that shooting down didn't actually occur because the Zero was able to, as I said, uh, fix his engine after he landed and get back to base. This gave Barber the opportunity to go for the bombers. As Barber turned to get into position to attack the bombers, he lost sight of them under his wing and when he straightened around, he saw only one bomber going hell bent for leather downhill toward the jungle tree treetops. Barber went after the Betty and started firing over the fuselage at the right engine. And as he slid over to get directly behind the Betty, his fire passed through the bomber's vertical fin and some pieces of the rudder separated from the plane. He continued firing and was probably no more than 100 feet behind the Betty when it suddenly snapped left and slowed down rapidly. And as Barber roared by, he saw black smoke pouring from the right engine. And so the, my excerpt finishes by Ames, Roger Ames saying, flying back to Guadalcanal, I heard Lanfear get on the radio and say, that son of a bitch won't dictate peace terms in the White House. This really upset me because we were to keep complete silence about the fact that we had gone after Yamamoto. The details of this mission were not to leave the island of Guadalcanal. All right, so uh, as soon as Lanfear landed, he raced off to claim that he'd shot down Yamamoto. As I said, that started.
So, the most important Japanese leader after Emperor Hirohito and the Japanese Premier had just been assassinated and of course that was a morale boost for the Allies and quite devastating for the Japanese. But who was in the second of the two bombers that were shot down? Admiral Natomi Yugaki, the Chief of Staff for Yamamoto, was in the second bomber. Now, he survived the crash, but later ended his life in a kamikaze mission at the end of the war. His diary survives and is translated as the book's called, and it's been translated into English obviously, Fading Victory, the Diary of Admiral Matomi Yugaki, 1941 to 1945. However, his son refuses to allow the period of this attack from the diary on Yamamoto to be published. Yamamoto's death is announced uh, weeks after it happened. There's the front page of the Nippon Times with his photograph and the account of the story. And in the Japanese press, the irony of him dying in an aircraft when he was a naval man as somebody who promoted aircraft was not lost on the Asai press who said a death most befitting one who had put so much of his being into the naval air arm. And I think this is a good little uh, modern update about the, uh, the story and, and where the wreck is. The man known as the mastermind of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor at one stage also wanted to invade mainland Australia. So when code breakers intercepted Admiral Rokoko Yamamoto's flight schedule in 1943, a daring assassination plot unfolded. Victoria Cross recipient Mark Donaldson travelled to Papua New Guinea, the island of Bougainville, to find his plane. 70 years ago, Australian troops were forging these waters. We've come to find a relic which resonates through the decades. It's still remote, and finding the ghosts of war is difficult. Accessible only by swampy jungle track. A trek very few have made. This is Yamamoto's plan. Yes, the Supreme Japanese Naval Commander, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, mastermind of a dastardly sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, gunned from the skies of the South Pacific by these on the Air Corps flyers. History will judge me for what I'm about to do. Immortalized in Pearl Harbor movies, it's what Yamamoto did here and made him the biggest threat to Australia in World War II. Rabaul, on the island of New Britain. And from this base, soldiers, sailors and airmen of Imperial Japan can attempt to break the fragile hold of Americans and Australia. Rabaul became Japan's most important strategic base in the South Pacific. Just down there, more than 100,000 troops were garrisoned. From this harbour, Yamamoto launched his powerful fleet into the Coral Sea and sent invasion forces to Papua and Kokoda. Rebel was made a fortress, anti-aircraft guns ringing the mountains to protect Yamamoto's fleet. And underground a vast tunnel system to protect their troops and leaders. This is the very bunker from which Yamamoto plotted his war. From here he would have sent the message that killed him. Yamamoto would leave from Rabaul on a morale-boosting trip to his bases. This unit film actually shows him at Rabaul airfield seeing off Betty Bombers, the same type he himself used on his death flight. It would be the longest range intercept of the entire war, skimming 30 feet above water to avoid radar for a 1,000 kilometre round trip. And four lightnings will 
The intercept operation was a very complicated long shot. It required absolute precision timing. But there was one vital thing that the Americans had in their favour. They knew that Yamamoto was obsessed with punctuality. We were apprehensive whether we would find the bombers or not. And when we hit them right on the button, we couldn't believe it hardly. And we were elated. Rex Barber shot him down. That was the propaganda version with dummy footage. Rex Barber gave the real story before he died. I started shooting across into his right engine. I pulled in right behind him and continued to shoot at the right engine. The engine uh, started to smoke badly, black smoke pouring from it. Japanese films have painted a heroic end. Yamamoto stoically accepting his fate. The wings are there, I'm guessing. And that's the front, that's the thruster, the, you know, the tail. Yamamoto sat in here, near the rear of the plane. The bullet that killed him possibly made this hole. Looks like one, because it's pushed the middle out that way. Yeah. The Admiral was found strapped in his seat, his body cremated, some ashes were brought back to Japan. Yamamoto died a hero, the Japanese people were told, in the front line, meeting death gallantly in a war plane. His loss was greater than many battleships. The war carried on for two more years, but Japan's hopes may have died here in the jungle with Yamamoto. In Bogenville, Mark Donaldson, 7 News. <laughs> Hello, Dami. We should. This is like modern apartments, just a bit different. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. I guess so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.